Hello, and thank you so much for inviting me to your education conference here in Slovenia. But it's a challenge of our times to better connect the world, the real world, with the world of schooling. Now, schools are very good in keeping students inside and the rest of the world outside. Well, the future is about, you know, making learning less a place and more an activity to, to integrate different worlds of learning, to ensure that students have a good understanding of the world they are learning for, making learning more relevant, more engaging, more project based. And actually, you know, what I show you here has not become better, but actually became worse. When you think about it, you know, over half of 15 year old girls you know, uh, only look towards 10 occupations now. The world of work has become so much more diverse over the last decades. But the perception of young people about the future of work has become so much more myopic. You know? Driven by what they see on television, not what they see out there. Now. Is that something schools need to start to work on? And digitalization will transform everything around us in fundamental ways. Now, digitalization is incredibly democratizing. Everybody can participate, collaborate, engage. But it's also concentrating power at the rate we have never seen before. Technology is incredibly particularizing. The smallest voice can be heard everywhere. You post something on Twitter and the world can follow you. But technology is also incredibly homogenizing squashing individual differences, cultural uniqueness. No? You know, helping students gain a sense of identity has become so important. Technology is incredibly empowering. No? The most successful companies are no longer created by a big industry, but by a big idea. They usually have the product before they have the money. But technology can also become incredibly disempowering. When we become the slaves of algorithms, we no longer understand. No? And in this world, once again, education needs to provide students with a reliable compass. Of course, knowledge will always be part of this. But the kind of knowledge that will matter for the future will evolve. And once again, the future will always surprise us. Very, very difficult to predict the future. The best we can do is not, you know, imagine the future and then learn from it, but to prepare ourselves for different futures, to imagine alternative scenarios. And if we are good and capable to, and prepared for different scenarios, we'll be also be better prepared for the future that eventually arises. Of course, you know, one scenario is, you know, that education will sort of remain where it currently is, improve, gradually progress, and so on. Now, after the pandemic, many people said, no, 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 we are not going to go back to the past. We're going to go towards a very, very different future. But, you know, it's going to take a lot of effort to make that happen. The natural tendency for education is, you know, to stay where it, are, where it is. It's very, very hard to change education. Some people say, you know, moving school systems is like, you know, changing, uh, moving graveyards. You know, you cannot rely on the people out there to help you. The status quo has so many protectors. And sometimes, you know, we as parents are part of the problem, not part of the solution. You know, we get very anxious when our children no longer learn what was very important for us. Or we get even more anxious when they start to do learn things we no longer understand. Teachers are sometimes more likely to teach how they were taught than how they were taught to teach. And as a policymaker, you can lose an election over education when something small goes wrong. You rarely win an election over education because, you know, it just takes a lot of time to translate good ideas into better outcomes. You, know. you may not see those outcomes. You're successful. There's a you know, big asymmetry between the costs and benefits of education. You want to change something? You have to pay for it now. You have to convince people it's a good thing. You know, uh, the benefits are uncertain. And they are in the long run. And that's very, very difficult to you bring people along to create that ownership, you know, of change among participants. And where you don't, you know, engage teachers in the design of reform and change, they cannot help you really with implementation. No. And then we have very, you know, complex governance systems, many layers in the education systems. 
We don't have an education industry like the medical sector has that supports the education system. We have badly felt this in the pandemic with technology. Very, very tough situations. And also, you know, remember that it's never programs and initiatives and pilots at scale. What scales is culture. And culture is always the hallmark of effective leadership. Culture is about system learning. It's about system-wide innovation. It's about purposeful collaboration. If you want to achieve transformative change, don't ask yourself, you know, whether your people will follow your instructions. Ask yourself how well your people can really collaborate. The real obstacle to education reform is often not conservative followers, but to conservative leaders. You need to be, as a system, really transparent with teachers and school leaders about where you want to go and why, what reform would actually mean for them. You need to be aware of how organizational policies and practices can either facilitate or inhibit change and transformation. You need to tackle institutional structures that are often built around the interests and habits of adults, not of learners. You need to recognize emerging trends and patterns and see how they may benefit or obstruct the goal of change. And you need to have a really good understanding of what motivates people. Change is often, you know, like a huge iceberg. You know, you only see the small visible part above the waterline. You know, this is the class sizes, the structures, the, uh, the, the resources, and so on. The invisible part under the waterline is usually about, you know, the beliefs, the interests, the capacities of people. No? You don't, you know, address those, you will not change the system. Now, that's why our systems are so heavy to slow, so slow to change. Maybe one day they will crack apart under the pressure. Maybe, you know, schooling will disintegrate, you know, technology will take over. And, you know, for many of our students, the digital world has already become the real world. Now, you can see here in Slovenia, over a th uh, students, 15-year-olds, spend over 30 hours per week on the Internet. And in countries like Denmark and Sweden, it's over 40 hours, close to 50 hours. The digital world has already become the real world. But, you know, to be a digital native doesn't mean that you are digitally skilled. When we measure the extent to which students can actually, you know, navigate the internet effectively. Yeah, in East Asian countries, typically students are very good at that. You know, they can distinguish fact from opinion. They can, you know, navigate complexity, search for complex information. Slovenia is also quite well positioned on this. But you can see in Slovenia, as in most other countries, the majority of young people are not ready for the technologies that they have in front of them. That's the reality with which your education systems need to cope in the years to come. And, you know, the technology is actually a powerful driver of change. It can help, you know, personalize learning, improve, you know, uh, student engagement. It can, you know, help us understand the dynamics in classrooms through learning analytics. It can improve equity, particularly for students with special needs and for education systems. Technology can signal where students fall behind, support teachers in teaching and manage accreditation and logistics. But, you know, reality still looks like this. PISA shows the more students use technology in classrooms, actually the poorer they come out on the PISA test of digital literacy. And that's true whether you talk about playing simulations at school or doing homework on a school computer or using learning apps or websites, whatever. And it's true, you know, quite true for across countries and cultures. Now, there are lots of reasons that can explain this, you know, but the bottom line is that more technology will not translate into better learning outcomes automatically. It will require new pedagogies, new ways of working in the education systems. But let me introduce a third scenario. No? Maybe schools will become more centers of our communities. No? Better integrate, you know, different kinds of services. No? Better integrate the cognitive, the social and emotional functions. And again, in the pandemic, we have seen a lot of evolution in this direction. No? Schools taking more ownership of the social welfare of students. No? And actually, if you look to Slovenia, schools do have a lot of a space to do that. No? When you actually ask yourself, you know, how much discretion do schools have, you know, to make decisions? 
there is a lot of possibility in Slovenia. Not as much as in the Netherlands or the Czech Republic or England, but quite a lot. So taking ownership is very, very important. And last but not least, you know, one last scenario, maybe one day, you know, educational institutions will fade into the background, you know, learning will take place anywhere, anytime, anyhow. It's a scenario, you know, which will not make teachers less important, but give them very, very different role. In this scenario, you know, as a teacher, you don't need to just be a good instructor. You also need to be a good coach, a good mentor, a good facilitator, a good evaluator. And I think it raises the question uh, that, how we can make sure that technology will always remain human-centered. You know? you, when, when it comes to education, we need to more carefully reflect on what are the appropriate roles of you know, educators and technology. You know? Learning is never a transactional process. It's always a relational process, a social progress. You, know? you can see you know, technology can provide supportive information to teachers. It can advance to control specific tasks or it can take over larger tasks where technology signals teachers when they need to interact. And you can see there are applications where technology has taken over some tasks almost completely. But where on that spectrum do we want education to be? What's the right space, the right role for education on this? These are the questions educators need to ask themselves today. And, you know, ultimately, we also need greater investment in innovation. Global education venture capital remains tiny when you co compare it with other sectors. And when you look at, you know, progress, it's mainly a story about one country, about China. No? In 2014, over half of global education venture capital was in the United States. In 2020, China's share had risen to 63%. And you can barely see Europe, not to speak of Slovenia. So there are many scenarios in which the world could evolve. And, you know, the future could be any combination of those scenarios. It's really about, you know, us learning to think divergently, learn to imagine different futures, learn to imagine how those futures could play out and ultimately, you know, become better at understanding the future that we want. No? The future could be any combination of what I just showed you. And the future is likely to look very different in different places around the world. But you know, such scenario thinking gives us tools to explore the consequences of you know, changes for the goals and functioning of education, for the organization and structures, for the education workforce, and for public policy. Well, I hope, you know, here in Slovenia at this conference, you'll find good answers to those questions. Thank you very much.